Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Teme Banigo. I graduated in 2008 from Northeastern's College of Arts and Sciences, and I now work and live in Abuja, Nigeria. On behalf of Northeastern University and its young global leaders, I want to welcome you to the first edition of Global Perspectives. Global Perspective is a program that aims to bring together thought leaders in business, social impact, entrepreneurship, and innovation for a compelling exchange of ideas. Our aim is to build a platform to share knowledge and affect change. We'll be meeting every other month and our focus will move to a new region for each session. A Nigerian myself, I'm proud to kick off the first edition of Global Perspectives with a focus on Africa. Our content is changing rapidly with a few African nations asserting themselves as, a true, as true global lead players. But the combination of the oil price collapse and the coronavirus pandemic has created a new and unforeseen challenges ahead. Today, we hope to discuss West Africa's essential elements of resilience and what the future could hold for its economy. Before we go any further, it is my honor to introduce the president of Northeastern University, President Joseph E. Aoun. President Aoun has been helm of Northeastern University since 2007. He's a renowned scholar and innovator in the realm of higher education. He will tell you more about his vision for Northeastern and its expansion as a global university. Uh, thank you, Temi, and uh, th uh, good day and good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, I want to thank uh, the Young Global Leaders for organizing this event uh, today. And I think this event has a special significance for us at uh, Northeastern, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that in one minute. But let me also start by welcoming the new Global Leaders, too, who are joining us, and also the parents of the incoming students and the incoming students who I understand are joining us today. So welcome. Welcome to Northeastern and welcome to this network of uh, Northeastern uh, alumni that is lifelong and worldwide. So I personally believe that what you are doing in terms of uh, focusing on the global perspectives is more needed than ever. Why? Because we are living in a period where every society is retrenching. We are seeing people focusing more on their issues within their countries and that there is nothing wrong with that. It is important and it needs to be done. But also we are all interdependent. Take the issues that you're going to discuss today. Energy is one of them. Take the issue of COVID-19 that you're going to discuss too. We're all dependent on each other. We cannot know, you know, a virus doesn't have boundaries, you know, doesn't look at state boundaries and say, I am going to stop there. Similarly, when you look at energy, when you look at climate change, the same situation holds. Now here at Northeastern, we have an alumni network that is worldwide, that is in every continent, and I mean every continent, including Antarctica. And we also, as you know, have a network of 3,000 companies, NGOs, institutions working with us to provide co-op opportunities for our students and partnerships for the whole community. But though this network doesn't exist by itself. This network is a network based on people, based on our alumni, based on our parents, based on our friends, and you are making it happen on a, a, you know, we are making it wider every day. You are making it more impactful every day and you are making it more relevant every day. That's why I wanted to be with you to thank you more than ever. A global perspective is needed and I'm glad that you're providing that. So thank you and the floor is yours again. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, Thank President. Uh, in a minute, I'll be introducing you to my fellow young global leaders, Basil Zumblat, who will be moderating the talk 
and Ayo Ayabanjo, who will be in charge of moderating the question and answer session. But first, I want to call your attention to a few features of this Zoom session. You are welcome to introduce yourself by giving your name and your city or country of residence in the side chat bar. Questions to the panelists should be asked in the Q&A box. Our program will start with a 30-minute panel discussion moderated by Basil. Basil Jumblat is an investment professional at Peninsula Capital Advisors, a private equity fund with $4.5 billion under management, focusing on growth equity investments across Europe. Previously, he worked in Singapore and in New York in direct investment teams. In parallel, Basil oversees investment activities in West Africa, ranging from family-run businesses to startups, with a focus on commodities trading, industrial operations, tech ventures, and tech ventures. Basil is a member of Northeastern's Young Global Leaders and graduated from the university in 2017 with a major in finance and minor in international affairs. Basil, on to you. First of all, thank you, President Aoun, for the generous and rich introduction. And thank you, Temi, for the intro as well. We're now going to deep dive into the core of Africa's new challenges and current ecosystem landscape. The private sector in Africa has dealt with constant difficulties, such as crashes in oil prices, security, whether on a food level or humanitarian one, and the lack of infrastructure and electricity shortages across the continent. Our three respected speakers will go ahead and address some of the key questions that many of us want clarity on. It's a pleasure to have you on board, Mr. Oye Hassan Odukale. You've driven the growth of Leadway Insurance Nigeria as Managing Director and CEO for more than 25 years. You received the National Honor Member of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and sit on the board of several blue chip companies, including First National Bank. Mr. Oye has earned his degrees from the University of Houston and is also an alumnus of Lagos and Harvard Business Schools. To start off with our first topic, it is important to note that Africa has mainly been perceived as a continent of endless resources, including rare metals and gemstones, such as gold, bauxite, and diamonds. Not to mention, Africa is also extremely rich in oil. We've seen countries such as Nigeria and Angola that oil prices and policies dictate the economies in nerve wracking ways. The question that is hardly addressed is whether African nations can become independent from oil and to what extent. Mr. Oye, the floor you. is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Brazil. Let me thank the young global leaders uh, for this opportunity. I was in your school, your university some four years ago when I graduated and I was and I can appreciate the diversity of the university. Uh, when we talk about African oil, uh, first of all about Africa, because we have a large audience and uh, some people don't really understand what Africa is all about. They just think Africa is like a country. Africa is a, is a continent, a very diverse continent with South Africa at, at, at the till bottom and Egypt at the far north. Of course, you know, Egypt also is an Arab, Arab country. Uh, this is for people that don't know much about the continent. Prior to COVID-19, Africa recorded a decent GDP growth in 2019. Countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana topped the chart with average growth rate of over 8%, while Zimbabwe, Equatorial Guinea, Sudan are recording negative growth. Overall growth was about 3.8%. So Africa was looking very well, very interesting then. Uh, my country, Nigeria, was not, the star, was not one of the star performers. We were just under 2%. Nigeria is the largest oil producer in Africa and is, and, and is trying to diversify our economy. This has been going on for quite a while now. In addition to oil in Nigeria, we have other mineral products also that have been neglected and probably I'll call it, use the word abused because some people have just been stealing part of it. So there's a lot Nigeria can do also in terms of developing other minerals in the country. But agri is the main focus area, and I'm happy uh, Rotin is joining us. Uh, I've looked at Rotin's profile, and, uh, and I was quite excited when I read about him and, and, and listened to some of his interviews. 
But uh, it's, it's journey, I agree it's a journey for us. Uh, we, we, it will take the, the right policies, but the emphasis from the government is now looking, is not, in that, is not in that direction. But when we talk about uh, Africa independence from oil, oil is a, is a finite resource. The world is moving from hydrocarbon to cleaner source of energy. So Africa is just a matter of time for Africa, for oil to be less important in the, in, in the scheme of things. But despite the low price of oil, we still have, uh, because I have some friends in the industry and they are still bullish that so far you are a very efficient producer, you can still do good business in that, in that space. Uh, but the focus for us now is to develop other, other avenues. But let me uh, uh, remind everybody also, mention everybody also that Africa is the future, really, I believe so. If you imagine all the people that Africa, that have trained all over the world who are Africans, it's a matter of time. The African spirit is in them and they, and they will come back home. When they come back home, we will see we, Africa will change. Governance is still a problem in Africa, but also that cannot go on forever. We have the potential, we have the people who know what to do, but we just need the right policies. So I think for people looking at Africa, it's the right place to look for, look at right now before things start, started to blossom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oye, for the valuable information. And I think most of our speakers will probably agree with, with all your points. Um, now introducing Mrs. Nenan Kongo, who has been a principal at Digital Growth Africa, an investment company founded to support the digital transformation of the African continent. She's responsible for sourcing and executing Bigame's investments, ranging from two to $10 million in high growth African entrepreneurial companies that leverage technology to sustainably deliver goods and services. Nena earned her degrees from Princeton University and Columbia Business School. Nena, as, as an investor, how do you mitigate and factor in the risks that the oil industry pose to the financial sector? In other terms, how are financial projections really capturing the associated risks with the oil industry? And how does that impact the activity of foreign investments into African countries? The floor is yours, uh, Nana. Uh, Basil, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I think, uh, you know, let me start by uh, echoing uh, the points of uh, Mr. Oye. Um, in that, you know, all oil producing nations are currently working to diversify their reliance on oil. So from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, as well, you know, articulated or stated African nations. So I think that, you know, both the trend of looking for cleaner energy sources um, and just for having a, a broader based economy are uh, reasons enough for uh, government focus on them. I, I think, you know, my introduction and my bio uh, highlights my bias. Um, many of, the, of us who focus on technology in Africa are trying to steer clear of the more extractive uh, industries. And, you know, so while natural resources clearly provide uh, richness in the sub-Saharan African context, um, you know, we look to focus on other growing segments of the economy. Um, how we think about, you know, the oil, especially weaker oil, um, depends on the type of investing you do. Um, from my pers perspective as a, as a venture capitalist, um, you know, the oil environment provides us with information that we use and incorporate into our macroeconomic picture um, of, of a nation. So that when you're looking at, at the macro, you would say, okay, what's happening to the currency? What's happening in terms of foreign exchange debt? What's happening to near-term consumption patterns? Because you know, the, the growth um, or the projected growth of my businesses is clearly going to be impacted in, in weak or near-term economies. Um, and so things that challenge near-term growth are going to um, have a negative impact on um, my projections of, of future business performance. I, I think um, 
I think Mr. Roy also pointed out that Africa is not a country, as many of us you know, who work across uh, and live and work across the continent uh, know. Um, and some people outside of Africa may, um, may know less and be less aware of the diversity of macroeconomic environments we have within Africa so that uh, operating in Ghana or Togo is different than operating in South Africa or Egypt or Ethiopia. And I think that for those of us that have uh, a Pan-African view, so my remit allows me to invest from Cape Town to Cairo, um, what I do in the near term is if I think that Nigeria, where I live in Lagos, is more challenged, um, I might choose to spend more of my time focusing on businesses in Nairobi for the next 12 to 15 months. So I think um, depending on the investor mandate, I think we'll um, lead one to choose their adaptive strategy um, around weaker oil. Thank you. Thank you, Nano, for the uh, um, insightful response. I think there was some sort of, of glitch in, in your sound, maybe if you can uh, double check on, on that end. Um, did nobody hear me? I mean, is is no, we did, we did, we did for sure. But okay. I think there was there was some sort of uh, of a uh, glitch on that uh, on, the, on that noise. That, that, that's all right. Thank you. Um, so to get back to, to, to the question, uh, I wanted to address Rotimi Williams. Uh, he's our third speaker. Uh, Rotimi is is actually the owner of the second largest rice farm in Nigeria and founder of Resolute 40, a tech startup founded to bridge the communication gap between volatile agricultural communities in rural Nigeria and security agencies. Mr. Rotimi earned his degree from the University of London. So, so Rotimi, it, it would be helpful to understand your perspective as an agriculturist in regard to that controversial natural resource. If you can you know, give us more color on, on, on that on that sort of topic, uh, it would be uh, extremely helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Basil, for the introduction. Um, well, where do I start? Um, I'm going to highlight three three ways in which um, the, the dwindling oil prices affected my industry, which is agriculture. Um, the first being cost of production. Now, because uh, uh, pretty much every well, the main efforts and our foreign exchange earner for Nigeria is oil and gas, is our industry, the oil and gas industry. So if anything happens to oil prices, we basically feel the shock. Now what we're experiencing is an increase in the cost of production. So pretty much everything we require to produce uh, here is imported. So from your fertilizer, which is blended, some of the material needed are imported. Your, your herbicides are imported, your pesticides are import, imported. Some of the diesel we use in Nigeria is imported, the equipment to use is imported. So, it's pretty easy to see how, um, um, you know, the, 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 the dwindling effects, the foreign exchange, uh, uh, or the devaluation of the Naira itself can affect or is affecting the, the, the industry. A lot of suppliers now are adjusting their prices to, to uh, what, 365 Naira to a dollar. Now, the current prices are today is 455 Naira to a dollar. That's a, that's a huge increase and a lot of price adjustment is taking place. And I mean, the local farmers' ability to, to afford this, this uh, new price, this new prices hasn't changed much. So that's a big problem. Um, also, if you look at Nigeria, we're also a big importing country. Pretty much uh, a lot of food we consume here is, is it's imported, even it down to rice. As of three years ago, I know the figure was about $2 billion uh, import, import bill out of 6 billion, import, the, the total of 6 billion import bill for rice alone. Right, and so with, with the um, building oil prices, the cost of importing food also becomes an issue because even if the country could afford it, which is struggling at the moment because the president came out uh, a few days ago to say that we didn't have money for importation and all, everyone, everyone needed to go farm. Um, even if the country could, could afford to import food, the question is when the food gets to the market, can your citizens actually afford the produce, uh, the product, uh, the food in the market? That's another issue. And then lastly, the, the, the third issue I've identified with the dwindling oil price has to do with the bank, the banks in the country. Because a lot of banks are exposed to, uh, to these dwindling prices through their um, investment in a lot of the oil and gas companies. I mean, when oil, oil, oil hits zero, I, I know a lot of 
a lot of the banks panicked and you know that's caused a huge issue in their book on their books so what you are seeing now is uh there's a reduced appetite to even give out funds because they're they're, they're all uh, scrambling at, the, at this point in time so that from the funding side that's a huge 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 problem i see going on even with the interventions from the federal government uh prior to prior to 2020 uh we, we, we've seen the cbn put out a lot of funds to support the agricultural industry but then oil price was decent but uh, i think 30 or dollar per barrel. I'm not quite sure where the CBN funding is, is going to come from. So again, I don't know what the future is, the future of intervention funds uh, holds at, at this point. So these are the main concerns for we farmers. I mean, it sort of poses a great picture that with, with, oil, with the oil industry uh, sort of hanging on one leg, it, it presents an opportunity for the agricultural sector to, uh, to, to sort of grow. But again, what the funds require to do this are hinged on, uh, on, 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 the, on the foreign exchange and from, and from the, oil, the oil and gas industry. So that for me is it's an issue. It's a big issue and it's an issue that we need to fix ASAP. Thank you, Vartumi. I think these are very uh, great points. Uh, and it's extremely important to understand how oil is linked to the supply chain of many other sectors. Uh, such as agriculture in, 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 in this instance. Um, so, you know, we're now going to shift towards a global problem that needs immediate attention. COVID-19 is no strange visitor to the African continent. African nations have faced severe viruses and diseases such as Ebola, HIV, and SARS. How is COVID-19 any different? Are African nations ready to face such an epidemic? Let me take this question to Neno, and then I would like the input of Mr. Oye and Rotimi. Neno, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Basil, and I hope uh, the sound is uh, a little clearer for everyone. I think, you know, first and foremost, um, COVID-19 is a public health crisis. And, um, you know, we're in a pandemic, and, and clearly there are the challenges of dealing with that. I think what makes this crisis different is that from the others that you mentioned is that we're also dealing with, you know, the worst both supply and demand challenge from the economic side of things. And it's not regional. Uh, this is, uh, someone asked me to mute and unmute myself. I'm not sure if that's helping. Hello? Um, anyway, uh, I'm going to continue. Um, Effectively, you know, many um, poverty, um, I think someone said, is a, is a comorbidity um, of the disease. And, um, you know, challenges around um, sanitation, um, challenges that make social distancing very hard, i.e. if people don't leave the house, they don't eat. Um, and the lack of public infrastructure in many African nations will clearly make fighting um, the disease challenging. Um, I, however, am encouraged um, in my particular business um, by the opportunities that COVID-19, I believe, will uh, throw up. Um, I am starting to see and am heartened by um, really the acceleration of digital and digital models um, across Africa and, and really the acceptance and potential acceptance I see for these models um, in the aftermath of, of COVID. I'm gonna use a, an example. In my estate in, in Lagos, um, my, uh, my steward you know, goes to the local corner shop to, to buy things for the, for the apartment. And the local corner shop um, never, their card machine was always broken. Those of you who know Lagos um, know that the, the card machines uh, are electronic um, financial infrastructure isn't always functioning. And so you always had to use cash. But in the aftermath of COVID, the store has suddenly made it a real priority to work with mobile money and electronic forms of payment in a way that, you know, we've been encouraging or trying to use this kind of, um, or really reduce our reliance on cash for many years in Nigeria. 
And so I think that people are thinking globally more about the use of an integration of uh, online education models, e-health models. And so I'm hoping that the COVID crisis will provide Africa with the opportunity to um, exponentially increase its acceptance of digitization across all sectors, uh, which is the thesis of what I do. Um, but while acknowledging that, you know, this is still a real crisis for governments and uh, societies to deal with until there is a widespread and affordable vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. I think uh, just a quick comment. I think that the, the, the noise is still there. Maybe you can check that again. Um, so to, to move on, I think it would be helpful to see uh, Mr. Oye's view on, on, that, on that point. Uh, Mr. Oye, uh, could you please give us some, some perspective on that? Thank you. I'll just give you a general perspective on COVID-19. Now, uh, we, like every other country, we are all fighting this disease. And uh, sometimes we don't know how, where it's going to come from. But overall, in, in Nigeria, let me just use Nigeria and Africa as a whole, I think we have more, we, because we are not able to do enough testing. Uh, testing is not easily available, and where it's available in the private sector is very expensive. So I estimate that we have more cases. But the, 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 the other side of it, which is the proper, probably more interesting, I mean, for us, is that we are, the debt if the dead cases are very low in Africa, that I can't explain. Now, in Nigeria, we have a population of about, let's say 200 million, 180 to 200 million. The recorded debt of officially about 250, 250. Let me times that by, by 10, 2,500 in a population of 200 million. Uh, I don't think it's as alarming because we also have malaria and people are dying of malaria every day in, in Africa and Nigeria. But the, the scared factor is a lot about COVID. Uh, is, is, that is the biggest fear we're having, the scare factor, because you don't know who is infected. Uh, how do you know whether your steward is infected or your daughter is infected? But most people are asymptomatic. So you don't see from them, they're not sick. They, they operate very well. I mean, we did a test of some people that work uh, at some particular facility recently. And we found out that uh, about quite a bit of the people, that I mean, staff there are infected. Now, they don't even know they're infected because every, everything is good. They work, they're doing their work. They're okay, no, nobody's sick. Uh, sometimes I don't even know whether we, the results are very, uh, the correct result, I don't know. I don't know. So I think for us in Africa, in Nigeria especially, the fear factor is the biggest problem we have. Of course, people are dying, uh, but the death rate in COVID is very, very low in, in Nigeria, very, very low. And I think in Africa also very, very low. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oye. I think, uh... Your points are, are, uh, are extremely uh, insightful, but you know now switching to to Rotimi, I think as an agriculturist, do you you know how, how does that affect rural areas in Nigeria, for example? Uh, can you give us your your views on that and and you know some some action, some live data maybe on on this kind of uh, you know situation in rural areas? Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Basil. So um, just to add to what uh, Mr. Mr. Oye and Nena have said, uh, I'm just going to take mine more from the agricultural perspective. Um, I, I think for the agricultural space, I think COVID, uh, the effect of COVID actually presents more of an opportunity for us, an, op an opportunity to look inwards in terms of production. Um, gives us that opportunity because now basically the global, with the global lockdown, most of the ports are closed, the borders, the, the, the surrounding countries, the borders are closed as well. So a lot of the smuggling routes for food into the country are locked down. So the true, uh, true production uh, figures are actually being exposed at this point in time. So we now realize that we're really not producing as much as we thought we were, we were producing. 
and also uh, our reliance on importation of rice and, and wheat and, and the likes from uh, other countries as well, with that also uh, not happening as much because of the lockdown, presents us the opportunity locally to actually focus on our agricultural sector. Uh, how well are we doing with that? Uh, we'll wait and see. I think it's still early days, but uh, the, signs, the signs are good at this point because the conversation has started, but we haven't seen much of a much movement in terms of funding because you need to mobilize. Again, like I said, this is the rainy season farming, right? 80% uh, of the food we produce here are produced in the rural area by subsistence farmers. So they're really only focused on, on, on one, one cycle a year, which is rainy season. They can't afford the, 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 the dry season farming. So this is a time for the government to intervene and make sure that all farmers are able to farm. So we take advantage of this season. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait another year now, with the lockdown uh, closure of borders, then there's a lumen food crisis if we don't do that. If you go granular down to the rural area, how the effect of COVID is affecting them, I didn't think they would take it seriously. I, didn't, I honestly didn't think that uh, the lockdown uh, restrictions would affect rural area, but they are. People are staying away from each other. A lot of, the, a lot of my farmers, a lot of people that work with me have chosen to stay indoors which obviously poses a big problem because usually for works on the farm, we we'll all come together and get the work done. And that's a huge issue. Um, getting the right um, face mask in the rural areas is almost impossible. Uh, they're using inadequate fabric as face masks. Uh, also sanitizers are quite difficult to get. And they're also, they're now doubled in prices. So in the rural area, they're not able to lay their hands on it. So generally a lot of those farmers are staying away. However, that's not the only issue. Again, we rely here on labor migration. So during the rainy season or during planting season, we rely on skilled labor coming from neighboring states to help with the planting, for example. And with the lockdown, interstate lockdown, that's very difficult. A lot of the farmers are not able to move from state to state to actually, uh, to actually um, present their, or to, to present their skills. So that, that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And for a country of 200 million people, you can see how hard it will be for government to sort of step in and create logistics for specifically for farmers to be able to move from state to state. So that's a big challenge we're facing at this point. I'm, I'm heading to the farm tomorrow, for example. And already I know that we're already short of people of labor, skilled labor on the farm. I'm totally concerned about uh, proximity on the farm. I've bought tons of face masks and, and sanitizer. I, now I need to go educate them on how to use them if they do not know how to use them. And I guess when I get to the farm tomorrow, I'll be able to figure out more about more of what is really going on on ground. But like Mr. Oye said, the death, the death rate compared to other countries, uh, surprisingly and thankfully, are, are pretty low. Uh, so I, I think it's still business as usual per se on, on that note. Thank you. Thank you, Otimi. I think this was very interesting. Yeah. Um, I would like to take a step back a little bit and transition into another question that's also directed to you, Rotimi, given that we're talking about yeah. agriculture here. So I understand that many countries in Africa source their food from rural areas and that lack of infrastructure and other factors make it dangerous and hardly economical to support local farmers and agriculturists. Could you tell us briefly about how data collection would help the agriculture industry as a whole? Okay, so I mean, when it comes to data collection, I guess um, the application is quite broad. Uh, if we're talking about food price uh, data or we're talking about data in general, I focus like um, the think tank I run, which is Resolo 4.0, we focus on data collection from conflicts. So what Resolo 4.0 does is a think tank that focuses on communal conflict uh, uh, particularly the farmer had a crisis, pretty much every local government or almost all local governments across all 36 states have one form of communal conflict or the other. And that's a huge, that's a huge issue. That's a big issue that we've been struggling to deal with. And we've seen conflicts uh, escalate in the past, in the past three, four years. Uh, so those are, I experienced this on my farm, for example. So I've not, I wasn't able to farm for a period because of imported issues from, from neighboring communities. And my land is pretty much used as, uh, uh, as, a, as an IDP camp, which is internal displaced people's camp for people fleeing conflict from neighboring communities. So I couldn't farm. 
So I created Resolute uh, to sort of help in terms of um, getting the getting the right uh, getting the security agencies to the conflict area within I mean in very very short period because a lot of the reports were that look they couldn't communicate with security agencies. Uh, so we created an app basically that has a panic panic button function that uh, we have trained the villagers, we supplied the phones to them for free, and we trained uh, the, the, rural, the rural farmers there um, how to use it. That once they feel there's an imminent, imminent attack or ongoing attack, they push the panic alert and immediately a call comes through to them. And simultaneously, the military also gets the information as well as the, 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 the national security advice. I guess it's information. So men can be deployed to the right places immediately. And this has been a huge issue here because hundreds and thousands of people have been killed. And when people are killed, a lot of people avoid those areas. So farming activity slows. Now, part of what we do that, I, if I must say, I also think is interesting because I've seen the results is we collect the data. So for every attack that goes on, that, that occurs, we collect the point of attack, the location of attack, the time of attack, the frequency of attack, and then we're able to draw sort of what we call the conflict trend analysis, where we're able to almost predict to when the next attack or where the next attack will take place. We know when the time when the most attacks happen, for example, and then we give the, the, the military this information so they can strategize and ensure that those areas are covered and the attacks are reduced to the barest minimum and life, uh, the loss of life is also minimized so that activities can go on. So that's sort of what we focus on and we're looking to expand this across the country to areas, other areas where they have, where they have conflict. Because if you look at everyone on this call, for example, if we were going to farm, we're going to have to go into the rural area. Now with issues like this, there's no way you and I are going to go into the rural area to farm. So these are issues that are huge issues that need to be dealt with. Now, if you take the issues of communal conflict and you add that to everything else going on in the country and in the world today, you can see how much of a, of a, of a problem that poses. So that's sort of the focus. And in the future, we're hoping to use this data. And I, I guess it's where I was going, uh, hoping to use this data to also enhance the life of the people in the rural area. So we know where you live. We know where your farm is, for example. We know, where you, we know, we know about that area. Where we should be able to link, to sort of bridge that gap between the rural farmers and insurance, crop insurance, home insurance, that's sort of what we're looking at for in, in, in the medium to, to long term, not immediate now, because we need to sort of scale up uh, as well. So in a nutshell, that's sort of how we're using data to address in, 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 in communities in Nigeria with regards to conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Otumi. I think it's very interesting and also admirable to see that the young generation in Nigeria are contributing to the countries in groundbreaking ways. Um, I would like to go on with many additional questions, but unfortunately, we'll, we're a little bit short on time. Um, so to address my last question, I would like to get your opinions on a common denominator to all challenges that we've discussed about, and that's the electricity sector. Without access to power, it is almost impossible to flourish economically as a nation or as a continent. Are African nations making any progress at all in this space? And to what extent do foreign investments play a role in that sector? I think, uh, Nena, if you can take that question and let us know your views. Sure. Uh, I'm hoping I put a manual uh, microphone on, so hope that it's a little bit clearer for people to understand. So again, um, as a, a venture investor who focuses or has a mandate across all of Africa, I would say that um, you know, the lack, uh, the under electrification of the continent is clearly a problem. It's a problem for manufacturing, but it's also a problem for um, life. Um, many, many years ago, I think I uh, did a study and came up that the cost of uh, goods or basically the lack of electrification or grid power in Nigeria added on average anywhere from 40 to 60 percent on costs. Um, in terms of, of goods and services delivered. And so uh, more efficient delivery of electricity clearly could have a material impact um, on, on life uh, in Nigeria and, and the cost of goods and services. From my angle, um, you know, we are seeing the application of technology again to the electric electricity challenge. So 
everything from the proliferation of off-grid electrical, uh, off-grid business models, so uh, which we've seen flourish in, in East Africa that range from small cell um, businesses to mini grids and other um, specialized uh, applications of uh, alternative energy to businesses that enhance the efficiency of the grid. So a lot of these um, IoT monitoring type um, businesses. Um, right now, um, you know, there has been a lot of foreign funding um, up until I think the past two years, um, you know, FinTech and off-grid um, energy have been two of the, the greatest um, recipients of early stage African uh, capital investment. Uh, this investment is foreign and domestic. And I think you can say that the trends, if we, I was looking at them yesterday, according to Partech, you know, the volume of early stage venture has gone from about $277 million in 2015 to an estimated $2 billion in 2019. So we've seen a lot of progress, um, but the challenge is that there is uh, still so much more to go. And I will uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and I think it's great to hear that uh, there is progress happening because, as I said earlier, it's almost impossible to, to flourish as a, as a continent without, without power. Um, you know, technology would be impossible to implement uh, agriculture and all other sectors almost. Um, Mr. Oye, could, you, could we uh, hear your perspective on that, uh, on that question? and uh, see your, your points on, on you know, how electricity uh, you know, is, is, is sort of affected by the current landscape and what is being done. Uh, so if you can give us some, some color on that, it would be great. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. It's, it's a very so, sore point, uh, sore area for all of us and for us in Nigeria especially. There have been a lot of initiative going on, but still we're not getting the desired result. Uh, uh, in, uh, our president is taking it up personally now and uh, working with some other companies in, uh, abroad to take over some, a part of the transmission. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad because everything we do depends on the FCC. If we can resolve that in Nigeria with the energy and the entrepreneur of Nigeria, people, uh, I mean, G GDP will just sky skyrocket immediately, immediately, immediately. I also, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm too still optimistic that it will be resolved. There are a lot of initiatives going on. Uh, I don't know how it will, when, when it will be resolved, but I know it's a matter of time to be resolved. Uh, you can call me an optimist, uh, but probably I don't have any other choice than to be optimistic about, about my country. Uh, but it will be resolved, but it's still, is something that is drawing us back now. And I know that uh, Ayo was involved in some initiative there, and he's doing a lot of study on it. Probably can give us, if you allow him to give us some more insight into that also. Basel, that's to you as a, as a moderator. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Oye. Um, lastly, I would like to hear Rotimi's view on that. I personally know that in rural Nigeria, you know, there are a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot, but a certain amount of projects that are happening in the uh, you know, solar energy space and other, you know, types of renewables. Um, you know, but again, given that you're on the ground, what are your views on the electricity sector? And, you know, if you can give us some, some color on that, it would also be um, very helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Basil. So um, when it comes to electricity in the rural area, I think, firstly, the infrastructure is not, is pretty much non-existent to start with. Even um, the telecommunication must the are pretty, uh, uh, all on generators and the days when we do not have power for telecom. So that's a big problem. Now, what was the effect of this to the rural farmer? There's no encouragement for processing. So pretty much most of the, uh, the, the rural farmers are not encouraged to go into processing because of the high cost of, of electricity. They have to, f they have to power their, their processing, their small processing meals using, uh, using diesel. They, they, they're not able to compete, both locally and internationally. And when I say locally and internationally, is when you get into the, the markets, your the cost of production is, is ridiculously high because of, 
of the power, the, the, your, your energy cost per grain. Now, if you look at international markets, Nigeria also is not able to compete with a lot of other countries that have power because we're not able to reduce our energy cost, again, our energy cost per grain. So for me, it's a huge problem that if we really want to move this sector forward, and truly engage the rural community beyond just production and going going into processing, which is really where the the, the elevation from from the average rural farmer into sort of like uh, just going above that poverty line. And those sort of interventions have to take place. They need to be able to move from pure pure, pure production into processing, and for processing to take place, power is a huge component, and that for me is it's a huge problem. Even I have. I have these issues as well. I'm not able to compete because of the high cost of, of, uh, of, of, of milling when it comes to powering my mills compared to, to Thailand and whatnot. They have the captive power, they have the funding for that, they have the power lines, they're encouraged to do these things. So, and, and the, the interventions by, the intervention by a lot of the agencies, foreign agencies are happening, but they're not happening fast enough. And perhaps they're not also that, those strategically, not particularly in agricultural areas, more, more, more towards school uh, education, I guess. So a lot more needs to be looked into with regards to this. Thank you. Thank you, Rotimi. This was very helpful. I think it's very interesting to see the full spectrum in terms of discussing about oil and then electricity and how COVID impacts uh, everything, basically. Um, so thank you all for your responses. I will now give the floor to Ayo, who will lead the Q&A session. Just a quick introduction before I do that. Um, Ayo is originally from Nigeria. He's, however, born and raised in Bahrain in the Middle East and lived there for about 20 years. He graduated from the Demore McKim School of Business in 2013 and has since been a member of the YGL from inception. Workwise, Ayo began his career in, as a central banker in 2014 and has ever since progressed into different roles covering mostly governance and operations. Thanks again. And now the floor goes to Ayo. Thank you. Thank you, Basso. Uh, good day, good evening to everyone here present. We thank you for your time. Um, just to go straight into the conversation at large. Um, regarding energy, power, I would have to say in addition to power and energy, the two critical sectors to the development of a modern economy in the, 21st, in the 21st century, regardless of being in Africa, is uh, information, telecommunications, and power and energy. Here in Nigeria, we have successful implementation in telecoms, but uh, power has been less successful. We need to ask ourselves the questions, what's wrong, and investigate why this is, and in doing so, we can come up with solutions that uh, would work on the best front in the power and energy space in providing solutions. Uh, my background with the central bank, I can just give a little bit of insight. Uh, definitely, as my uncle, uh, Mr. Oye, and the other panel members, Nena, wrote to me, have all mentioned, power is a fundamental problem that affects all industries. Uh, at the central bank here, we have, um, we have, we, uh, we had created a lot of facilities funds and, uh, but the problem with this is that we release money in fixing the problem, but the fundamental problem in the power sector is the tariff, which is the electricity charge. And until it is bankable, in the case that it pays the cost, it pays the investor, and it pays for newer technologies. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem that uh, gets bigger and bigger by the day. But as my uncle said, yes, very optimistic because um, the, this administration is definitely trying to address this. Anyways, without further ado, I would like to initiate and kick off the question and answer to the spectators at large. I would try to wrap this up in about 10, 15 minutes due to time. Uh, there's a Q&A box down. Uh, I don't know if uh, the spectators have pinpointed it. So you can type in your question and hopefully we can 
um, open it up to our panelists. So question one, we have from, sorry, just give me a second, from Kaliga. I don't know where she is, but thank you for your question, Kaliga. Her question goes, can you discuss alternative energy issues in all industries in various African nations? So basically, I think that coincides with what Nana had uh, mentioned about mini grids and off grids. Uh, maybe Nana or any other panel member can shine some more light on this. Over to you. So once again, the question is, the question is can you discuss alternative energy issues in all industries in, in various African countries? So, I mean, I, I think I'll just add and say that, um, you know, the rise of alternatives um, is really, you know, seen as a solution to what has been a historic, um, histor the historic, I guess the unsuccessful or the limited ability of African governments to build traditional grid and transmission networks to provide broad-based uh, electrification to its populations. And so I think that people are simply um, trying to deliver electrification using other means, um, and they're using in part technology to do so. I think um, what people are doing is as they're you know, the technology exists and, and technology is getting better and better, but I think people are looking to build business models for companies that can be profitable um, and do so in scale. And so the challenge is uh, until we find a, a solution that, um, you know, sort of uh, hits all of the points within a Venn diagram, I think we're going to see lots of, um, you know, different models to do that. And, and also, you know, governments are, are innovating you know, with PPP models. Um, but I think uh, it's great to have more people focused on issues to bring about solutions. And so I'm, you know, less fussy uh, about what people are trying so long as the end result uh, in terms of in increased access to electricity is sort of met. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Um, Another question comes in from Justine Rose, and her question is to do more on the healthcare and pandemic COVID-19 at large. Her question goes, how do you see the future of healthcare across Africa? How well, sorry, how will the pandemic affect the industry? Um, maybe Mr. Rotimi or Mr. Oye could take a stab at this. Um, Mr. Oye, your mic is muted, and I think it was to me too. Sorry, uh, I think it's unmuted now. Uh, are you hearing me now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, the COVID, uh, it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, Please, I'm trying to get the, I'm seeing so many things on my mic. Um, can you repeat the question again? I'm seeing so many things. Sure, 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 I can do that. Um, so the question mm -hmm. goes, how do you see the future of healthcare across Africa? And how will the pandemic oh, okay. affect? Thank you very much. Healthcare, uh, like uh, different countries are addressing it differently. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, we are still, it's still, we have, we started some 15 years ago with the HMO model concept. Uh, it's not working as it should be. Uh, they are now, we're not having some, really what doctors are advocating is insurance, insurance, insurance. But the insurance industry is not really, it's just getting ready for that, area, for that aspect. Only one or two insurance companies are doing healthcare insurance in Nigeria right now. Uh, and uh, because you can imagine, we have over 1 million policies of, Nigerian, of Nigerians and expat Nigerians insured abroad because they don't have comparable products in, 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 in Nigeria. And one of the key issues also is not just insurance, it's just providers. 
providers, most of the providers that they're comfortable with are not in Nigeria. So when, if you're sick, most, especially, especially the, the experts, they want to be flown abroad. Now, for the providers abroad, they'll, they'll be more comfortable with a policy that is from their, their, uh, their region. Those are the problems we are, we are facing. But I can tell you that with COVID, there are a lot of initiatives going on. Last week, I was on a conference out on a Zoom call with some of my friends who are also in the medical fields, both in Nigeria and abroad, and there are initiatives going on. Because we have a lot of Nigerian experts all over the world. It's just creating the environment here and, and, and the facilities here for them to come home. And most of them are anxious to come home. Some even come regularly just for basic operations and go back. Some come once a month or whatever. So there are a lot of initiatives going on now and we are collaborating both from the investors part, from the investment, uh, from the funding part of it and also from the providers, the doctors abroad. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oye, for that insight. I'll, I'll I'll also take that. I think, um, you know, I'm beating on the same drum here. I think that um, healthcare in Africa is challenging. It is uh, fragmented, um, you know, with, with public health um, infrastructure on one side and private on the other. I will simply say that, you know, across the board, um, the impact of COVID-19 is to increase the acceptance or uh, an acceleration of, of digital digitally enabled models for any kind of service, good service delivery. Um, I was on a conference call, a webinar about a month ago um, for uh, like a, a group of venture capitalists and someone uh, gave me a, a quote of uh, the, in the US of um, the Stanford Health System had a telemedicine app that used to get um, I think something like 2,000 visits a month. And then in that first week of mid-March, they suddenly started seeing, you know, 3,000 people a day. And so I think that across Africa, you know, many people have been trying to um, focus on telehealth to some extent. Um, there are people that are looking at diagnostic um, solutions or more low-cost, lower-cost diagnostic solutions. Um, I think that COVID-19 will accelerate the efforts of entrepreneurs to provide solutions to delivery points at the healthcare value chain um, that, that sort of um, are driven by this remote access. That's my perspective. Thank you for that, Caroline. Uh, uh, sorry, um, Nana. And uh, you're, we could hear you perfectly as well. Um, I would like to get Mr. Rotimi involved. So, um, Maybe you could take a stab at the next question from Tevin. His question goes, do you think Africa is well positioned to bypass the typical industrialization trajectory and potentially compete with China as a global manufacturing hub or with India for outsourced talent in the tech sector? I mean, you're more than welcome to you know, channel it towards the agriculture space. But uh, once again, I'll repeat the question. Do you think Africa is well positioned to bypass the typical industrialization trajectory and potentially compete with China as a global manufacturing hub or with India for outsourced talent in the tech sector? Um, so I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring that home a bit and, and I'm not going to talk about other African countries. Um, this is what uh, I have knowledge, a bit more knowledge about. When you're talking about industrialization or tech, you know, you have to look at the foundation of these countries you're talking about. You're talking about the likes of China and India. They've been on this journey for decades. We in Nigeria are pretty much at the start of that journey. If you look at the conversation we're having here, we're still, we're still talking about electricity, electricity supply to certain areas where tech developers are at home, but they cannot code, they can't do their work because there is no power. So there are a lot of things, there's, there's, there's a foundation that needs to be laid before we even begin that conversation. Even when yeah. you look at industrialization, you need, you need power. You need power. Power is, is integral to this, both across, in fact, across all sectors. Those are the issues. So the issues, the certain need issues that need to be addressed before we even begin to have that conversation. 
We have to look at policies. We have to look at tax laws. We have to look at power. You have to look at, you know, pretty much everything that comes together to form a modern foundation upon which these industries and the tech industry can be built. What we're going to see in, in tech industry, for example, is basically an outflow of talents. We're already seeing that a lot of tech developers I knew two years ago in Canada today as we speak. Why? Because the better amenities, the, the, there's better pay, there's better healthcare facility. You know, it's just, it just seems like there's a better, brighter, more comfortable future for them over there. And it's all part of the foundation, right? How do you keep your talent so that you can grow an industry? That's a conversation that needs to be held. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Rotimi. Um, I would like to bring it in and uh, due to time, sorry. So I'd like to call on Michael Winston, who's our co-chair of the YGL, the Young Global Leaders, to thank the speakers. And uh, thank you all on, from, from, from myself. Michael. Uh, thank you, Ayo. Uh, the engagement today has truly been phenomenal. Uh, clearly too many questions to squeeze into the time we have. Uh, since President Aoun shared an introduction to the YGL at the start of this program, I'll focus my re remarks on relaying gratitude on behalf of the YGL, the wider Northeastern community, to everyone who had a hand in today's session. Firstly, we were all excited to join today to hear from our panelists, Mr. Oye, Ms. Nenya, Mr. Rotimi. We are glad to have you in the Northeastern community. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with the 190 of us who joined today's live session and the many others who will enjoy the recording in the days and months to follow. Secondly, the committee who organized today's program represent the best of YGL, truly, uh, committing their entrepreneurial energy to give back to the Northeastern community and create the first session of what will become a staple program of the YGL. A big thank you to Basel from Lebanon, Ayo from Nigeria, Teme from Nigeria, Ramsey from Ghana, Daisy from UK, uh, Deving from Kenya, Wasim from Kenya. Thank you to the entire Northeastern team, especially President Aoun for joining us today at the start of the session, for Carolyn, Catherine, and Caroline for organizing us all. And lastly, uh, to those of you who made a contribution to the YGL Impact Fund when you registered, uh, this fund directly impacts philanthropic causes that benefit our students and the com communities in need associated with Northeastern. Thank you. Um, for those who have not contributed yet, please consider doing so. Thank you all for joining us. Wishing everyone a safe and healthy year ahead. Great work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we'll close with that. Bye. Thank you.